the Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Um, for our first speaker today is Dr. Mark Doyle, who now only has one title. Um, he used to be the graduate director of the history department. Uh, is very sad. Uh, it was a really hard day for him uh, to lose the uh, really limitless power that he had. Uh, but <laughs> it is. It's there. There's a whole thing. I mean, we've we've had we had a ceremony. Um, so uh, he's going to talk today about. He's going basically going to figure out Brexit. Um, what's going to happen today? We're recording it. Uh, we're going to send it to Boris Johnson, and I'm pretty sure the whole thing's going to be set. Um, but uh, to look at the history of this, of what's going on, uh, and in a very real way, what it means um, as we go forward. So without further ado, Dr. Doyle. Uh, what I wanted to do is to, um, yeah, to solve Brexit. Um, a lot of people have been trying for several years now to, uh, to solve it. And so uh, obviously what, ne what needs to happen is my intervention. Um, Brexit happened, th the bre Brexit vote, Brexit has not happened, the Brexit vote happened um, three years ago, just over three years ago. And uh, Brexit itself has not happened, so there was a referendum, 52% um, of those who voted in Britain voted to leave the United Kingdom, um, and this process has been called Brexit. Uh, it has not happened yet. Um, out of curiosity, does anybody here in the room have a sense of why it has not happened yet? Stacy, anybody else? I'll give you a hint. It's on the screen right there, and it's yellow. <laughs> Isn't it something to do with, like, you said it in class, like Northern Ireland can't split from Ireland? Sort of. Um, I mean, it can't physically split from Ireland. The, um, the roadblock to Brexit has been uh, specifically what to do about the Irish border um, and how to deal with a potentially new border that would be between not only Ireland and the UK as it currently is, but a border between Ireland and the EU, uh, which would be the case should Britain uh, get around to leaving the EU. So what I wanted to talk about today was sort of wh how this became the, the holdup, what it is about um, the Irish case that is making it so sticky. Um, and to do that, you have to sort of do several hundred years of Irish history, which I will also try to cram in. But mostly, uh, I, I also I want to leave some time. We've got about an hour, so I want to leave some time to uh, just answer questions. Um, I pay attention to the Brexit stuff fairly closely, although I don't pretend to have any of it figured out. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions or to talk about how to teach uh, around these issues in the classroom and all the rest of it. So um, I guess the subtitle of my uh, talk um, and what I, I sh really should have named it to begin with. Um, why does the Irish border have a Twitter account? Uh, I, not only does the Irish border have a Twitter account, the Irish border's Twitter account has just published a book. Um, yes, a compilation of the best tweets. Apparently, this is, you can do this. Um, so that's that's um, I'm aiming toward that for my next publication as well. <laughs> uh, so these are just some recent tweets. Um, I'm still in charge of this whole fiasco, in case anybody is wondering. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I unfollow and then refollow re Brexiters uh, so that they get the message that the Irish border is following you. <laughs> no deal. This is uh, the possibility that uh, Britain will, will crash out of the EU without actually having negotiated a deal. Uh, it's a big bunch of Egypts, uh, and someone has left the lid open. And then I'm stockpiling tweets in case there's a no-deal Brexit. Um, <laughs> Not all of the Irish border's tweets are quite so polite. Um, these are some of the more safe for, for nine, nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Uh, um, I recommend you follow the Irish border before it starts following you. Um, so, okay, the idea here is to understand 
why Brexit hasn't happened. Um, you have to understand Irish history and the history between Britain and Ireland. Um, because it is Ireland that is sort of the, the holdup. Um, so what I'm going to do first is just give a little crash course. Britain and Ireland, Irish history. And, and then we'll, we'll get into the current situation and, and sort of how to talk about this and how to uh, maybe explain all this to, um, to non-Brits, uh, non non-Irish non people in an American context. So Ireland and Britain. Um, so Ireland is the smaller, if you look up at that circle right there, Ireland's a smaller nation there to the left, to the west of Britain. Um, they've been sort of tangled up in one another's history for hundreds of years. And it, it hasn't always been Britain always dominating Ireland. Sometimes the reverse has happened. Sometimes there's been lots of migration from Ireland to Britain. Um, but the sort of the modern uh, Irish story, the, the, the modern story of Northern Ireland, why there is an order there in Ireland, can really be traced back about 400 years. Um, around about the year 1607, following a uh, rebellion and war in Ireland between Irish, native, Catholic, Gaelic, Irish lords um, in the north of Ireland against British rule. The Br British have been trying to exercise their control over Ireland for several hundred years by 1607. Um, the Irish rebels are defeated and as part of the effort to pacify and control Ireland and then hopefully eventually bring Ireland more in line with uh, British, uh, not just make Ireland happy to be ruled by Britain, but to bring it more in line with British civilization, British ideas of civilization. The British crown and the rulers in Britain, uh, excuse me, I, it's 1607 so I'm talking about England. Britain doesn't happen until England and Scotland merge in 1707. Um, the rulers of England decide to colonize Ireland by um, essentially seizing land from the rebelling lords, seizing land from local Catholics, uh, primarily in the north, because that's where the rebellion was, um, and to populate that land with colonists from England and Scotland. Um, these colonists would be predominantly Protestant, Presbyterian in the north, Church of England or other uh, religious faiths in the south in, um, in England, and um, essentially to, through colonization, to implant British, English, sorry, English and Scottish civilization into Ireland um, to sort of solve the Irish problem. And solving the Irish problem has been kind of the, uh, one of the main preoccupations of the English and then British state for the last several hundred years. Uh, so you can see here, um, you've got Scots and English settlers sort of coming into those northeastern counties. Um, and then it's a little hard to read, but uh, the orange bits on this uh, map on the left, the orange bits are uh, privately settled, uh, privately planted. It's called the plantation of Ulster. Uh, red is predominantly Scot Scottish, blue is predominantly English, and then purple is mixed. It's not just the north. Um, there are, there were previous colonization plan uh, schemes in the south. There will be subsequent colonization schemes in the south. But it's in the north that, it, uh, that the colonization scheme sort of works the best, where you have the largest number of non-Irish, Scots and English, non-Catholic, Protestants settling. So that's why we have a Northern Ireland. So I'll, I'll sort of get to that part. Over the centuries since 1607, Northern Irish Protestantism developed a distinctive culture that was at various times um, either, how to put it, very pro-British at times and then feeling very betrayed and hurt by Britain, but still very pro-British at other times. Um, so it's sort of a frontier or settler society that emerges in the early 1600s. They are uh, seen by the locals as hostile invaders who have taken the best land, and they are attacked. There's an especially uh, fierce rebellion by Catholics against Protestant settlers in the 1640s. And this feeds a, uh, an ideology, or uh, I guess a self-identity among Irish Presbyterians and Irish uh, members of the Church of England, that they are, the vanguard of civilization in a hostile environment. People who are surrounded by uh, natives who do not like them, who have the wrong religion, who um, are ready to attack them, who have uh, 
strong reasons to want to attack them at any moment. And so there's this idea among Ulster Protestants of what's sometimes called the siege mentality, that we are besieged by enemies and that we have to rely upon ourselves. Uh, and sometimes we rely on the British over on the other island, but sometimes they betray us so we can't entirely trust them. So there's this strong uh, sense of self-reliance, of being besieged. And what happens over the course of the next several centuries is that Catholics, especially in the 19th century, in the 1800s, Catholic Irish in the South and, and also in the North become more assertive, start pushing for independence from Britain. Um, and as Catholic nationalists in the South start pushing for more independence, Protestants become ever more vocally, loudly attached to the British connection. Um, so you have events like this is a uh, march of the Protestant Orange Order, which is founded in 1797, um, to commemorate past victories over Catholics back in the 17th century. Um, they loudly proclaim their loyalty. So you will often hear the community de described as loyalists. Um, they will loudly proclaim their connection to the Union, which is the Act of Union, which happens in 1801, which merges Britain and Ireland into a single administrative and political unit. So you will sometimes hear them termed unionists. Um, and the terms are not exactly equal, right? Not all Protestants are unionists. Not all unionists would identify as loyalists. These days, loyalists tend to be, that term tends to be applied to the most hardcore, the most radical of the Protestants who want to uh, remain connected to Britain. And unionism tends to be a slightly broader term. And then, of course, Protestantism is a broader term still. Um, the upshot, though, is that as other elements within Ireland start pushing for more and more independence, as other elements within Ireland start um, persuading the British state to start granting them some aspects of independence, Ulster Protestants become ever more defensive, ever more um, uh, insistent on their difference, their distinctness from the rest of Ireland, and ever more insistent on their Britishness, even though the British themselves don't really see them that way. Um, the British uh, identity of the Ulster Protestant is, um, is always different than the actual British identity of people in Britain because they, um, they live in this, this unique circumstance. So, okay, fast forward into the early 20th century. Oh, I forgot that slide. This is an example of um, the uh, siege mentality of Ulster Protestants. So you've got uh, murals all over the north of Ireland, and um, especially in Belfast and Derry. This is one photograph I took maybe 15 years ago in Belfast, uh, depicting the attacks on Protestants by Catholics back in the 1640s. It says, the persecution of the Protestant people by the Church of Rome, Catholic Church, in 1600, 1641, what's a few decades between friends, uh, the ethnic cleansing still goes on today. So these memories are still very alive in the sense that we're surrounded by people who want us gone and out of this island is still very strong. So, okay, Irish border, when it was just a baby, before it had a Twitter account, <laughs> uh, is born in 1922. And the process by which it comes into existence is very long and complicated. Um, essentially what happens is during World War I, which lasts from 1914 to 1918, there's a rebellion in Ireland, the 1916 Easter Rising, commemorated here in another mural, primarily in Dublin. The 1916 Easter Rising, in turn, leads to a larger war of independence, which lasts in Ireland from 1919 to 1921. Prior to all this, there had been discussion of granting Ireland what was called home rule. Um, you see the postcard here is an anti Home rule postcard. Home rule would have been uh, giving Ireland its own parliament within Britain, a, a Dublin-based parliament that would have limited power, that would be still under the British imperial parliament, but would have control over internal affairs. This had been sort of the choice of moderate nationalists, people who wanted some independence for Ireland, but not a complete break with Britain. This was the constitutional negotiated settlement that a lot of people preferred. Home rule had been actually passed in 1914, then they had a war. The British said, we will implement home rule just as soon as the war is over, by Christmas. Turned out the war was not over by Christmas. And they had to keep fighting and uh, people became impatient and so they had a rebellion. Back when it looked like Ireland was going to have a home rule parliament, Ulster Protestants in the North started arming themselves. They formed an organization called the Ulster Volunteer Force. 
1912. The Ulster Volunteer Force was pledged to fight anybody who forced Ireland into a home rule parliament, anybody who forced them, the Protestants of Ireland, to, um, to be Irish, to live under a Catholic-dominated Dublin parliament. And the people they were uh, prepared to fight included the British state itself, right? because the British state would be the one to impose the Home Rule Parliament on Ireland. And so you have a paradoxical situation whereby Irish Protestants in the North are arming themselves to fight the British state for the right to remain British. That's how loyal they are <laughs> to the British state. Um, which sounds, I mean, when you put it that way, it sounds ridiculous. It does make sense um, because they see the British state as having uh, been seized by revolutionaries and radicals who uh, don't have, who are be acting in an unconstitutional manner and they're, they're able to justify it to themselves. But essentially, the arming of the Protestants in the North means that when Ireland does in fact get its independence about uh, eight years after the formation of the, uh, ten years after the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force, it means that um, Britain itself, as well as Irish nationalists in the South, um, they don't want to get into a situation in which they're coercing Northern Protestants into a Southern Catholic-dominated independent Ireland. And so they draw a line on the map. They say, this is Northern Ireland. It will remain part of the UK. And in the South, they create the Irish Free State, which is still kind of technically part of the British Empire, but will find ways to kind of wriggle its way out over the next several decades. So in the northern six counties, northeastern six counties, which are predominantly Protestant, about two thirds, those six counties remain part of the UK, but they are ruled from a parliament based in Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland, city in Northern Ireland. They um, have control, that Belfast parliament has control of its own internal affairs. Um, it has control over uh, taxation and the distribution of government money. It has control over all sorts of things. But that Belfast parliament in the north of Ireland reports to the British government in Britain. In the South, as I say, uh, Ireland in the South kind of goes its own way. Um, and so then, for the first time in 1922, we have an international border on the island of Ireland separating the southern and western 26 counties from the northern six counties. As sometimes happens in the case of Ireland, um, having solved what they thought was the Irish problem, British rulers focus on other things. They turn a blind eye to what happens in Northern Ireland and essentially let the rulers of Northern Ireland um, do what they will without much outside interference. So to be clear, Northern Ireland is still part of the UK. They are voting and sending members of parliament to Britain, to London to serve in the House of Commons. They are um, under British rule in all, all sorts of ways. They take part in World War II, all the rest of it. But there is this other mini subordinate parliament that meets in Stormont Castle outside of Belfast, which controls internal affairs. It is dominated by a party called the Ulster Unionist Party, which is a Protestant party, which sets about ensuring that they will, that they, the Protestants, will secure, have a, a sort of an iron grip on power and as far as possible wealth within the province. So there's systematic discrimination at both the state and the private level against Catholics. Catholics are less likely to have government jobs. Catholics are less likely to have good private sector jobs. Catholics are less likely to get good housing. This is especially important after 1945, as Britain sets about building a welfare state and spending lots of money on, on public housing. Um, Catholic housing tends to be less good. Catholics have to wait longer uh, to get into new housing. Protestant neighborhoods tend to get better housing and, and so on. And at the in the private sector, uh, Protestant landlords tend to discriminate against Catholics. So Catholics end up in the private sector renting less good housing as well. Um, Northern Ireland in 1922 is founded in a sort of an atmosphere of violence. 
and terrorism. Uh, there's a war going on in the South, the Irish War of Independence. Uh, the Northern Irish state is very insecure, very fearful that Catholic uh, rebels or terrorists, as they call them, will try to destabilize the state. So back in 1922, they give themselves emergency powers, powers to imprison, powers to stop and search, powers to uh, sort of round up people without uh, due, due process and, and throw them in jail, internment powers. Um, those powers that are granted in 1922 remain on the books uh, into the 1960s. Um, they are used almost exclusively against Catholics. They are used to put down any tremor of unrest. One more point is that because of the gerrymandering of electoral districts, the strategic drawing of electoral districts in the North, the uh, Ulster Unionist Party, the Protestant party that runs the country, ensures that Catholics retain a minority of power kind of anywhere. Um, even in areas of Northern Ireland where Catholics are in a majority, for example, the city of Derry, where it's about 85% Catholic, the electoral districts are drawn in such a way that um, Catholics are unable to c control the city government. Um, so the Catholics are all sort of bunched into one district and the Protestants have two districts and so they get more votes and so they control the city government, which means they control housing, they control jobs. So this gerrymandering is super crucial to the, uh, the way that <coughs> the Protestant party retains control over Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland remains more or less uh, stable, although there are tremors of unrest from 22 to 68. Um, and then things start to change. In 1967, a uh, civil rights movement emerges in Northern Ireland. Civil rights movement inspired by the civil rights movement here. Um, they look at the situation in uh, the Jim Crow South and they draw the obvious connections and parallels. I mean, it's, you know, there are strong differences as well, but they are inspired by Martin Luther King and the other civil rights marchers here, not only by their message, but also by their tactics. So the Civil Rights uh, Association of Northern Ireland is founded in 1967. It is then, uh, you know, they start holding marches, they start having sit-ins, they start uh, protesting and demonstrating. Uh, initially as a peaceful um, protest movement to get more civil rights for Catholics. And it involves Catholics and liberal Protestants in this movement. Those peaceful civil rights marches are ruthlessly suppressed by the state by the almost entirely Protestant police force in the North, by the um, collaboration between state officials and um, civilians, Protestant civilians, who uh, attack marches, who burn Catholic homes. And this sets off a sort of spiral of, of violence that eventually gets out of control. From about 1969 to 1972, the um, Northern Irish government loses control of the situation and you have the emergence of paramilitary organizations in the various uh, neighborhoods. So the Irish Republican Army, which had been the army that fought the War of Independence back in 19 to, 1919 to 1921, had never really disbanded, was still around in the late 1960s, early 1970s, had never been reconciled to the partition of the island. Um, so the Irish Republican Army emerges in the violence and the sort of um, the burnings and the riotings and so on in, of the late 1960s, emerges as the defender of the Catholic community. They say, you can't trust the police. You can trust us. We will defend you. A parallel development happens in the Protestant neighborhoods where Protestant paramilitaries such as the Ulster Volunteer Force, the Ulster Defense Association, the Ulster Freedom Fighters, the Red Hand Commando, the Loyalist Volunteer Force, there's a whole bunch of them, um, emerge to, as the defenders of the Protestant community against IRA violence. And in the meantime, the, British, uh, the, the Northern Irish state seems incapable of acting in an impartial manner, incap incapable of gaining the trust of the population. And so Britain, finally, in 1972, after an especially bad uh, several months of violence, Britain steps in and says, right, we'll handle it from now on. They shut down the, British, the Belfast Parliament. They impose direct rule. And from 1972 until 1999, Britain rules Northern Ireland directly. Initially, um, the arrival of the British Army in, in Northern Ireland in 1969 was greeted by Catholics as, as a relief. Like, thank God, the British are neutral. They won't hurt us like the Protestant state here in Northern Ireland does. 
but they were quickly disabused of that notion. <coughs> British forces, because they were defending the constituted authorities, eventually sort of get sucked into the conflict on the side of the Northern Irish state. Um, so when Britain sends its, uh, basically abolishes the Northern Irish par Parliament and establishes direct rule, this gives the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, um, the sort of the propaganda twist that it needs in order to present its war, not as a war against Protestantism, not as a war of self-defense, uh, or not as, a, yeah, but as a war against British imperialism. And this is very much how it's sold uh, around the world. Ireland is fighting British imperialism. And what gets lost in that story is that it's really a three-way battle. You've got IRA, nationalist, Catholic, uh, paramilitaries, you've got the British state, and you have loyalist paramilitaries who are somewhere, who are not exactly supported by the British state, but are sometimes um, secretly supported by the British state. Uh, so those three forces are sort of locked in a really complex dance. From 1972 to 1994 or so, um, it's low intensity conflict but it is an intensely violent one. Um, it's mostly bombings, assassinations, targeted attacks and not so targeted attacks on um, state officials as well as civilians by all sides. In the course of which about 3,000 people die. Over 3,000 people, I should say. Um, which is a lot in a country of about 1.5 million. Almost nobody would have been untouched by violence, would have known, uh, almost nobody would you know, not know somebody who had been killed or certainly wounded um, in the violence. It's incredibly uh, protracted, it's incredibly um, difficult to see a way out until the 1990s when things start to change. So here's the border. During the Troubles, the border was what in today's parlance would be called a hard border. The Irish border was, it was never entirely sealed. It's um, incredibly difficult because, of course, there hadn't been a pre-existing border before 1922. Lots of little roads running all over the place. Um, in fact, in 1989, the British government conducted a survey of the border and determined that it would be uh, physically impossible to actually close off the border. Um, this doesn't stop them from massively patrolling the border. There are uh, constant patrols along the border of jeeps and helicopters, police checkpoints, military checkpoints, watchtowers in, in especially troubled uh, spots along the border. But it's never entirely sealed. As a result, there's lots of smuggling that goes on between the two. Um, and there's also a considerable amount of um, paramilitaries, like IRA guys, uh, fleeing the police in the north, going to uh, south of the border to safe houses. And, and the British can never really manage that. Um, the Irish Times, not too long ago, put together a, uh, a compendium of border incidents reported during the Troubles to give a sense of what it once was like. When you had first shown us the map of the Ulster Plantation, you had like Donegal included in, especially like the Scots settlement, but then that was excluded from British Northern Ireland. So how did that happen? <laughs> um, Northern Ireland was, the, the lines were drawn just based on population. So Donegal has a majority Catholic population. Okay, so even though it was part of the original kind of... Yeah, um, a lot of areas that were part of the plantation scheme in the 1600s, um, they, uh, the plantation plan was much bigger than the plantation reality. So most of the people who came over tended to stay right around these areas in the Northeast. Um, these also become the more industrial parts. Um, and one thing that I, I should have emphasized is that the only part of Ireland that has an industrial revolution is the North. Um, and so this ties the Northern Irish economy quite strongly to the British economy and to the British Empire. Um, Protestants in the North say that the reason that they had an industrial revolution and the rest of Ireland is wallowing in huts and having a famine is because they're Protestant and that they, you know, they have these values of thrift and hard work and all the rest of it. Um, that's 
one of their explanations. And so when it comes time to think about whether Ireland should be independent and home rule and all that, they say, well, if we lose, uh, our, if we're cut off from Britain, we will, our economy will suffer. Um, so this is a partial map of just some of the incidents that happened along the border during the Troubles. This road was repeatedly uh, cratered by the British Army, uh, and the and locals, locals tended to um, undo whatever sealing the British Army tried to do. Um, so the uh, border checkpoints are often attacked. There are shootings, um, arson attacks. Actually, probably most of the violent stuff would have been right over here. So one of the concerns, and I'll talk about the actual Brexit uh, issue here in a second, but one of the concerns is that if we have a return to a hard border, if we have a return to a situation of checkpoints and, um, and searches and all the rest, that um, those elements within Northern Ireland that have never been reconciled to the peace process, those elements, especially on the Republican, that is the pro-Irish uh, unity side, um, will the border checkpoints will become targets for that kind of violence again. Um, in a way that hadn't been the case for a long, long time. Um, I highly recommend the Brexit coverage being done by the Irish Times. They uh, are doing an excellent job of providing the Irish perspective. So finally, okay, in 1998, there's a peace agreement. After years of false starts, after secret talks, after a ceasefire by the IRA in 1994 that is broken, um, I won't get into the, the elements, um, all the elements of the, of the Good Friday Agreement, as it's called, because it's signed on Good Friday of 1998. But some elements are pretty relevant. Um, one is the idea that um, both Britain and Ireland, and the various parties who are part of the agreement, they agree to uh, what's called the principle of consent, which is, as long as the majority of the people of Northern Ireland want to be part of the UK, it will be. Right? So Ireland, the, so the South, gives up its territorial claims to the North. Um, but also, equally, Britain says, we will let I Northern Ireland go. <laughs> I think they'd let them go tomorrow if they could. But we will let Northern Ireland go as soon as a majority of the people of Northern Ireland express a desire to leave. Right? So that we're not coercing you into staying part of the UK. Um, and Ireland saying we're not coercing you. It, it's, it's the free choice of the people of Northern Ireland. Um, there's a new mini parliament, the National uh, Northern Ireland Assembly, set up in Belfast that instead of being dominated by one party as it had been up until 1972, will now be a shower, power sharing, not a shower sharing, that would be, <laughs> that might actually solve some of the problems, yeah. Um, a power sharing body in which Protestant and Catholic parties will work together. And in fact, there's no one leader of the, uh, of the Northern Ireland Assembly. There's the first minister and the deputy first minister. And those two uh, people have equal powers within the Northern Ireland Assembly. And the idea is that one of them will be from the Protestant side and one will be from the Catholic side, um, which worked for a while, uh, but hasn't worked so much lately. Series of North, South, and uh, British Irish bodies. So one of the things that had not happened much during the Troubles themselves was people in the North uh, at, at a government level talking to people in the South, people in Ireland talking to people in Britain. So there are a number of institutional bodies there. Um, a police force is set up in the North that eventually gains the trust of the majority of the population, which had not been the case before. Uh, the various par paramilitary organizations, most importantly the Irish Republican Army, but not only the Irish Republican Army, agree to give up their guns, and then gradually the demilitarization of the border. Oh, and I guess an, another important one is that residents of Northern Ireland uh, are able to choose their nationality. They can have Irish or British passports, um, which would also be really complicated uh, if and when Brexit happens. So the Northern Ireland Assembly took years to get going. There were all sorts of arguments over policing and over arms decommissioning and when the IRA would dump its arms and where and whether there would be photographs and who would be taking the photographs and who would verify that the photographs had been taken. And you know, all, like that, the, it's eight years of sort of stopping and going. But finally, for about 10 years, um, they make it work. Um, the most extreme, as it happens, uh, unionist and nationalist 
political parties, the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, and Sinn Féin, uh, share power effectively for, for 10 years. Um, and it uh, falls apart in January of 2017 because of leadership changes in those two political parties, um, because of some uh, scandals and some disagreements over specific pieces of legislation. But the point is that since January 17, there has been no Northern Ireland Assembly. They haven't been meeting. They haven't been able to agree on a basis on which to form a government, which means there are civil servants that are basically running the country in Northern Ireland. Um, Britain itself is kind of, you know, sort of kind of reimposing direct rule over Northern Ireland, but not really. Um, what they had been waiting for, so Brexit vote happens in 2016, the assembly falls apart in 2017, um, and they say, well, once Brexit's sorted out, then we'll, we'll renegotiate a return to the Northern Ireland assembly, and Brexit, here we are three years later, and it's still not sorted out. The peace in the North is fragile. I mean, you could go to the north of Ar Northern Ireland today, and it, it doesn't feel really any different than any other part of Ireland or the UK. Um, it's peaceful. It's uh, you know shopping and um, freedom of movement and all the rest of it. But um, below the surface, there have there are reasons to be concerned. Um, among those reasons is the strong feeling that uh, Catholics have won and Protestants have lost in the peace settlement. And there are various reasons for that. Segregation, this is not mandated state mandated segregation, just the uh, tendency of Catholics to live among Catholics, Protestants to live among Catholics, to work among Protestants and Catholics, to uh, go to school among their own kind, is actually worse now than it was during the Troubles. Um, the sides have been kind of polarized and gravitating toward one another even more than before. So that 94% of social housing, the government funded housing in which lots of people live in Northern Ireland, 94% of it is still segregated. That is Protestants in one area, one building, and Catholics in another. There are more peace walls now in Northern Ireland than there had been during the Troubles. Peace walls are, like you see here, uh, a, a wall, a, usually a concrete um, cinder block wall topped with metal railings and then sometimes topped with barbed wire even above that to keep uh, Protestant and Catholic neighborhoods apart to prevent violence. Uh, the first one went up in 1969 uh, and they keep going up. A couple of them have come down but in general they're growing rather than declining. Schools remain segregated. State schools are overwhelmingly Protestant. Um, so Catholics mostly go to schools run by the Catholic Church. Um, and there's still paramilitaries. Uh, they have put their guns beyond use. The IRA has called off its armed struggle. The various loyalist paramilitary groups have called off their armed struggle. Um, but for 30 years, you had a situation in which uh, gunmen had uh, unusual freedom and uh, put themselves forward as the defenders of their communities. And that situation continues, um, although in a lot of cases the paramilitary gangs have essentially morphed into drug gangs or, uh, or uh, criminal smuggling gangs, if not drugs. And then there's a continuation of Republican splinter groups. So Republican in Ireland means people who want a unified Irish Republic. They're the main IRA and its main political voice, Sinn Féin, have signed up more or less full-throatedly to the peace process and said, you know, we're not going to win this militarily. This is the way to achieve a united Ireland. It's through political process. But there remain small minorities among that old IRA who were never reconciled to the peace process. So there's the new IRA. There's the continuity IRA. There, I think, I don't know if they're still around anymore. There once was one calling itself the real IRA. Um, they continue to uh, kill uh, uh, there was a, a high-profile killing of a journalist just in the last few months. Um, they plant bombs and so on. And so there's concern that these guys will start targeting uh, border checkpoints and so on. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. I read a book a few years ago, and I don't know how realistic this was, but he was making the point that when some of the peace started to occur here, that some of these splinter groups with their bomb-making technology went to hire for the Iranians, and that mm -hmm. technology that they had ended up in Iraq. The, to kill U.S. troops, and that because they were they were looking, you know, they had all these skills, right. and now they wanted to create money for this. And I just didn't know how fantastical that was. If that was. I don't know. On the surface, it sounds unlikely, just because a large number of 
This is especially true of the IRA. A large number of the, um, the deaths of IRA operatives during the Troubles were self-inflicted because they kept blowing themselves up. Right. So I doubt just how much expertise they actually had. Right. Um, they got their stuff a lot from the Libyans, from Gaddafi, um, and also from other international links that they'd made. It's not impossible. There, um, there was a high-profile case of IRA guys being spotted and arrested um, in Colombia. Um, so you know they, they do have international links. So it's not impossible. But uh, if I were looking for somebody who would be really good at planting a bomb, um, I would I would have a long list of of, of organizations uh, that that would come before the IRA actually. Um, but I don't know. It's yeah, it's not impossible. So. Brexit. June 23rd, the vote happens. 52% of the population of the UK votes to leave the EU. But if you look at how it breaks down, in Northern Ireland, 55, 56% uh, of the population vote against Brexit. In Scotland, 62% of the population vote against Brexit. Um, so it's really only England and Wales that are pro-Brexit, and even then, it's, it's not a huge landslide. It's, it's a very small uh, margin of victory. Ireland featured almost not at all in the pro-Brexit campaign. The anti-EU, let's leave the EU campaign, it focused on immigration, and the fear uh, both of um, more immigrants coming from within the EU, EU especially Eastern Europe, Poland, people not liking the fact that Poles can legally just move to Britain and it's fine, um, but also fears about um, the EU imposing quotas for refugees and asylum seekers and so on on Britain, right? So all, this was in the midst of a uh, large uh, influx of refugees from Syria and elsewhere, and so there was concern that the EU was going to force uh, Britain to, uh, you know, to take more immigrants than, than Britain. Uh, the many British people wanted them to. Um, and then the larger rhetoric was sort of reasserting our sovereignty, taking back control, as it said on the side of Boris Johnson's buses. Um, the sense that the EU was an anti-democratic organization um, that did not have Britain's own best interests at heart, and so the best way to run our country is to run it without foreign inter interference. Um, and that kind of argument actually has uh, play both on the ref left and the right. There are people on the left who quite don't like the EU because it's seen as an anti-democratic pro-banker organization, essentially. Ireland, as I said, hardly features at all in the debate. But Ireland becomes a major issue when Theresa May, the Prime Minister, uh, in the middle of 2017 called an election, a snap election, to strengthen her majority. Um, she had, her, she, so she's the conservative prime minister, was the conservative prime minister. She, in order to strengthen her hand in negotiating with the EU, she calls an election thinking that this will send a clear signal to the EU. Um, and it does, it sends a clear signal to the EU that um, Britain is hopelessly divided about Brexit because she actually loses her majority. The conservative party loses its majority in parliament and has to rely for its control of parliament on the Democratic Unionist Party, a Northern Irish party the DUP, that is the most it is Protestant, staunchly pro-union, um, pro-Brexit party you could imagine. The overriding priority for the DUP is making Ireland, Northern Ireland and the UK seamless, right? The, there, nothing will come between Northern Ireland and the UK. Ireland will remain, Northern Ireland will remain strongly part of the UK. That means that in any Brexit negotiation, the DUP is going to oppose any plan to treat Northern Ireland differently than the rest of the UK, which means the border becomes a problem. So the Conservative Party, the Conservative Prime Minister, relies on the DUP to run the government. And this hopelessly balls things up. This is how it breaks down. The blue are the conservatives, the red are the Labour Party, which is the predominant opposition party, yellow or Scottish, and then the sort of, uh, on this screen, sort of salmon-colored folks, that's the DUP. They form a pact with the conservatives. Basically, the conservatives agree to give Northern Ireland one billion pounds 
And in return, the DUP supports Theresa May as prime minister. So the problem is the border. What do you do with the border? Um, right now, it's seamless. Like, the only, there aren't, in many border crossings, there aren't even signs that say you have now left the Republic of Ireland, you are now entering the UK. The style of the road signs changes. The numbers change. They use a metric system in Ireland, and then it's the imperial our system, miles, in, in, in the north. Um, your cell phone provider changes. You go from Vodafone to, to O2 or whatever it is when you cross over the border. And that's kind of it. Um, there are 72 million crossings annually. People live in the north, work in the south. Goods pass, all, uh, pass across the border all the time. Uh, milk is um, collected in the Republic. It is sent to the north to be pasteurized and bottled and then is reshipped back over into the south. Like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's all bound up together. Um, so the solution that, that Theresa May came up with in negotiations with the, uh, with the EU was to treat Northern Ireland, or to treat the border slightly differently, but not entirely differently. So this is what's called the backstop. If you watch any Brexit coverage for any amount of time, you'll hear people talk about the backstop. The backstop is a, um, it's a cricket term that I can't begin to explain because I don't understand cricket. But it, it's basically, it's, it's a position within cricket that is designed to prevent the worst possible outcome. So the backstop is basically a safety net. It's the way to prevent things from a return to the hard border. So the backstop would, this is what May negotiates with the EU in November, allow Northern Ireland to stay within the customs union and the single market. The customs union is the, uh, the lack of any tariffs on goods passing between the EU and non-EU countries. Or, yeah, in this case. The single market is a much bigger situation. It, it has to do with the rights of members of the EU to live and work anywhere else in the EU. Um, it has to do with uh, common standards of safety regulations, common environmental standards, weights and measures. All that sort of stuff is, is standardized throughout the single market. And so the idea is that Northern Ireland stays within the customs union and the single market so that you don't have to impose border checks, so that people can move freely and live in one area, and so that things change as little as possible. And the UK, that is, well, actually that should be Britain, so Scotland, Wales, England, the other island, stays in the customs union, the lack of tariffs on trade, but does not stay in the single market, which is much broader. That's sort of what she negotiated. And it's supposed to be temporary. This is the temporary solution until we can negotiate a more long-term relationship between Britain and the EU. That plan was defeated in three separate votes in Parliament between November 2018 and summer of 2019. It is uh, disliked by the uh, hardcore ultra Brexit people who feel like this is not Brexit. This is like, what do we vote for? If we're going to stay in the customs union, if we're going to leave part of the country in the single market, this is not Brexit. It is disliked by the DUP the Northern Irish party that basically holds the balance of power because it creates a difference between Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, it's disliked by people who don't want Brexit because they don't want Brexit, right? So those three forces coming together uh, basically defeated it, which leads to the resignation of May in June. And so now we have Boris Johnson, who is no closer to solving the problem than May was. So Johnson is now the Prime Minister. He has been saying that he will negotiate a new deal with the EU. The EU has been saying for months, for over a year now, that the backstop is non-negotiable, that that is not going to change. And Boris Johnson is saying, I will negotiate a new deal. I will negotiate our way around the backstop. Um, so he's been in Dublin, he's been elsewhere. The real concern, the concern of people living in Britain 
at the moment, regardless of their political persuasion, is that after October 31st, the deadline, this is the deadline for Britain to leave the EU, is that Britain will just leave the EU. It will crash out of the EU. There will be no agreement between the EU and Britain, and there'll be chaos. There's concern about the supply of fresh food. There's a concern about the supply of necessary medicines. Um, there's concerns about long lines at the border, not only the Irish border, but the, the, um, the ferry crossing the, the borders um, between France and, and, and Britain. Um, it's hard to know what's gonna happen. Um, an election, a new election seems unlikely until after October. The two strongest opposition parties in Parliament at the moment, Labour and the Liberal Democrats, are in their various ways uh, positioning themselves to try to stop Brexit. Lib Dems are saying basically we will stop Brexit altogether if you vote for us. Labour is saying if you vote for us we will support a referendum, a new referendum, basically a do-over, um, to ask people once again if they really want Brexit now that they kind of know what would be involved. And, and now that they remember that there's this other island over here that could, you know. Um, from the Irish perspective, uh, there are a number of fears. It's not just that there will be a return to the violence of the 1970s and 1980s. There is concern that Ireland's, um, the Ireland's main trading partner, Britain, is going to now be outside of the EU and that's going to severely hurt the Irish economy. Um, there is concern about those customs checks and just long lines at the border. Uh, and then underneath all that is the concern that especially anti-British, anti-peace process splinter organizations will start blowing things up again. On the other hand, there is great hope, especially among people who want Irish unity, that Brexit will actually provide an opening for a referendum on Irish unity. Um, and the way it would work, well, there are several ways it could work, but essentially, if Brexit turns out to be a financial disaster, so far, signs are looking like it will be. Then the people of Northern Ireland will decide that it makes more economic sense to sign up with the South. Um, that people in the South, who haven't always been especially enthusiastic about joining up with the North, because it'd be very expensive for them, because the North is quite poor. People in the South will see joining up with the North as economically better than having a hard border. There is the possibility that Scotland which narrowly voted not to, have, not to go independent a few years ago, that Scotland will have another referendum and will vote to go independent, and then that may give momentum to people in Northern Ireland who want to. So there's all sorts of possible scenarios, um, but it does seem like on the whole that uh, it's hard to see how Brexit benefits Northern Ireland really at all, but it, in the short term, but it may in fact lead in the long term to um, Irish unity for all these various reasons. Um, so, uh, I put a few decent resources, mostly news sources, I guess they're all news sources, for, um, I think if you're still a little confused about what Brexit is and what it all means and what the terminology is, that BBC uh, site is extremely useful. They have a glossary, you can type in a term and it will explain to you what that term means. So for a left of center anti-Brexit perspective, uh, the Guardian's coverage is quite good. For a right of center pro-Brexit perspective, the Telegraph's coverage is quite good. And as I said, the Irish Times has been really killing it with their, their coverage. Um, really interesting, really smart, historically grounded analysis um, that's uh, often quite angry, <laughs> as you can imagine. I don't know, so I don't, what, what, what else can I tell you? What, uh, what is not clear? It's all clear, right? You didn't solve it. I didn't solve it, right. Um, I can't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, do you think it's unsolvable? I think if, like, so Doctor Who, if he could go back <laughs> to 2016 and say, look, this is what's going to happen, um, I, think, I think the Brexit referendum would probably fail and I'd be fine. Um, no, I, I don't know. I think it is possible. It looks like maybe the DUP, maybe the Conservatives, maybe some of the more hardline Conservatives, they're staring over the cliff face right now of a no-deal Brexit, which would be just, it would be utter catastrophe. People would die. There'd be, you know, it would, they're looking at that in a month, month and a half, less than a month and a half. And I think it's sort of a game of chicken, and I think they might end up blinking eventually and saying, okay, fine, you can have your backstop. Like, that might happen. Um, I don't know. I'm a historian. I just deal with the past. I can't say what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I pulled that line. Yeah. 
Yeah. We got a question. So I'm I'm a U.S. history teacher, so I kind of kind of U.S. Yeah. history centric. So I'm, this is fascinating. So my question is, how is the Brexit vote and the October 31st deadline of England leaving the EU? How did those get to be so linked, or are they separated? And my follow-up question that would to, to be is, and not to get too geopolitical, but yeah. Wouldn't Vladimir, I mean, to me this looks like the rise of nationalism preceding mm -hmm. global conflict, which mm -hmm. would be advantageous to Vladimir Putin in the East. So I guess those are my two questions. How do they get to be so linked, and then what are the geopolitical ramifications of this? So the, um, the original deadline for Brexit was back in March, March 29th. Um, basically, the, according to EU rules, if you trigger this one mechanism for leaving, then you have a certain number of days. So they triggered Article 50, and um, the deadline was March 29th, 2019. They didn't have a deal. So Theresa May went to the EU and said, can we have an extension for a few months? We've got a few things to sort out. EU said, fine. <laughs> um, so basically, they, the EU said, all right, then it's October 31st. That should give you plenty of time. Um, that's why that is. I, I think you know it, it is. It does seem quite likely that if something's not sorted out, then the EU will because it would be bad. A no deal Brexit would be bad for the EU too. That the EU will then say, okay, you can have another extension, um, but we're going to take ten percent off of your final grade. Um, <laughs> that's uh, what I think is that that might, that's, that seems fairly likely. Um, as far as the geopolitical thing and and Russia, there is evidence that. Um, Russian uh, operatives did intervene on the side of, of the pro-Brexit uh, campaign. Um, and uh, it, it is certainly a, it's hard to see how in the short term anyway, Britain uh, prospers and the British economy does okay, given all, all what's happening. And so insofar as Brexit weakens Britain, and that is in the interests of Russia and other foreign powers, then I think that's probably fair enough. Uh, you know, th think about that. The, the American context is interesting, because America was super involved and super invested in the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process in the North. Bill Clinton was very you know, hands-on, um, sent a, a special envoy to uh, mediate the, the negotiations in 1998. Um, and so today, the Democratic Party, which controls House of, Republican, uh, House of, uh, House of Republicans, um, House of Representatives, is saying that, any, that they will veto any U.S.-U.K. trade deal that uh, imperils the Good Friday Agreement and the peace agreement in the, in the North. So that, um, whereas, of course, Trump is pro-Brexit and, and wants to, you know, sort of negotiate a new, um, a new deal between the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, the Democrats are saying if, if that imperils the peace process, then we're not going to support it. So, yeah, it, it's, it, it's tricky. Sorry to ask another question. I understand the danger of um, the economic fallout if this goes in. What, what would be the upside? Well, like, why would President Trump be supporting this? I mean, not saying that he's wrong or right. I'm just, right. what would be the upside? Like, what's his vantage point on this? What's his angle? Huh. <laughs> I don't know, exactly. Um, I think the, uh, probably weakening the EU is in his interest. Um, and, uh, he may have some calculation as far as it might be, you know, somehow better for British, for American business if they're dealing directly with Britain rather than going through the EU. Britain might have uh, different safety standards and regulations, different environmental standards and regulations. So that'll be easier for American industry to deal with than if they have to deal with the EU, which can be quite strict about those things. So that might be part of it. Um, but he also, you know, he, he is attracted to Brexit as a cause because it is about um, national sovereignty and is, uh, you know, the, the big part of the appeal was uh, limiting immigration. And so all those things are sort of things that he is ideologically aligned with. Anything else? Really? It all makes sense? No, it doesn't make <laughs> sense still. Um, yeah. The, 
I've been wondering if Scotland was going to have another referendum and, and this time go the opposite way, and I still have kind of ambivalent feelings about that. Um, but when you see how closely aligned, uh, both historically and in the way that they voted, you know, in the last referendum that Scotland and Northern Ireland are, I don't know, do you think there's any chance of those two kind of clustering together? Because I'd never thought of that before. Right, the, the Republic of North Britain. Um, <laughs> you could go back and give it like a term like Strathclyde or, or oh, right. something yeah, else, you know, Hibernia. the kingdom of the Scoti or whatever. Right. Um, I think it's not impossible. I, it, um, in general, the Scottish Nationalist Party has been, you know, supportive of Irish unity and so on. I think one of the dangers is, I don't know if I can go back here. Um, one of the dangers with the Scottish scenario is that, so those yellow dots, that's the Scottish National Party. Um, if Scotland goes independent, then those yellow dots in Parliament disappear, um, which means that the anti-Brexit, anti-Tory, anti-conservative bloc gets even smaller in Parliament, which makes it harder to see. Scotland can't have an independence re referendum unless the British Parliament lets them have an independence re referendum. Same goes for Northern Ireland. So if Scotland goes independent, it seems... I don't, it seems like it might actually be harder for Northern Ireland to get an independence referendum because the conservatives will control the government and it'll, yeah. yeah so they'd have to time it. They'd have to, yeah. No, have I was, to I was just wondering, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, that is, I mean, the, the breakup of the EU, I, I have no doubt that if a referendum in Scotland were held tomorrow, they would vote for independence. I, I don't, uh, like, it's, that seems pretty clear. Um, I also, I thought in 2014 when they had the referendum, I was like, this is not a good idea. You're going to rely on North Sea oil for your entire economy and all the rest of it. Uh, but now I, I can see where that makes us sense. Yeah. They'll just, you have to restore Hadrian's wall. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's the answer. <laughs> more walls. More walls. Yes, that's, maybe that's why Trump likes Brexit. Maybe he's just got... <laughs> investments in walls. You know, he's just like, I got all this extra wall sitting around. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All right, we're out of time. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.